is the one that like makes you want to get up in the morning every day. Now, that is a dangerous thing to pin all your hopes on because the right idea is not going to be exciting for the entire process of writing. And I think that ends up being um, a downfall of a lot of uh, new authors is that they think that writing a novel means being inspired every single day. And it's not like that. Writing a novel is about motivation and determination and discipline. So I always say inspiration gets you started and discipline gets you finished. So you know, whatever that idea is that is really, really exciting you, whatever you can do to see it all the way through, even if you write like the crappiest first draft ever, I really, really urge writers to finish their projects. Welcome to the Author Like a Boss podcast, the podcast for indie authors who want to improve their writing, up-level their marketing, make money with their books, and have fun doing it. Now onto the show with your host, Ella Barnard. Hey bosses, if you have an author website or are thinking about getting one, I have a special offer for you. Stacy Sowers of Authors Mojo builds websites, is a technology coach for indie authors, and is my co-author for the book, Build Your Author Website. She's also an indie author herself, which makes this so exciting. For listeners of this podcast, Stacy is offering a free author website consultation. If you already have a website and want some feedback for improving it, she'll do a comprehensive evaluation of your site. If you don't yet have a website, but are thinking about taking that next step, she'll walk you through what you need to know to have a beautiful and effective author website. To take advantage of this offer and get a free author website consultation, go to authorlikeaboss.com forward slash mojo. Hello, everybody. Hello, bosses. We are here today with, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, Jessica Brody. So Jessica Brody is the author of more than 17 novels for teens, tweens, and adults, including The Geography of Lost Things, The Chaos of Standing Still, A Week of Mondays, 52 Reasons to Hate My Father, Better Than You, Better You Than Me, and three books in the sci-fi Unremembered Trilogy, plus the forthcoming Sky Without Stars which is a sci-fi re- reimagining of Victor Hugo's Les Mis, co-written with Joanne Rendell. I, do you see how I was straight in Les Mis? Because I was like, I don't speak French. <laughs> <laughs> it comes out on March 26th this year. She's also the author of the Descendants School of Secrets series based on the hit Disney Channel movie, original movie Descendants, and the Lego Disney Princess chapter books, Jessica's first nonfiction book, Save the Cat, writes a novel, a plotting guide for novelists. Released in October 2018, Jessica's books have been translated into and published in over 23 countries and two are currently in development as major motion pictures. She lives with her husband and three dogs near Portland, Oregon, where I am right now, which is really exciting. So, <laughs> so happy to have you on the show, Jessica. Yeah, thank you for having me. That was quite the introduction. I appreciate it. Yeah, I read the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm doing the whole thing because <laughs> look at all these good things. <laughs> but there was some questions on there. But first, first off, and normally I start with one question, but I'm gonna start with something else. I'm really curious, like, how did you feel when somebody contacted you about doing your books into major motion pictures? Uh, well, it's, uh, yeah, it's been surreal. I've had, I've had a couple of my books be optioned for film. And that means, you know, like the, the a production company wants to try to make it to a film. And so over the years, it's been um, sort of a whirlwind of, oh, they're going to option it. And then, oh, they're not going to make it. And, um, you know, so of course, that could always happen. But with these two that I'm working with a fabulous production company called um, Kintop Pictures and they're part of Reliance Entertainment and they've gotten farther than anybody has with any of my books. So they have um, screenplays written, which is really exciting. And now they're out with looking for directors and cast. So, um, you know, I've got my fingers crossed. It's just always really surreal, but then I, I kind of, I try to keep myself in check because you know, Hollywood's super fickle. Hollywood is super fickle. Yeah. So I've just learned, I actually used to work in Hollywood. So I, I just, I know to keep a, a poker face <laughs> about it, but like inside I'm kind of screaming. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's what I was, I was like, how is that? How does that feel? Cause, cause I think, 
it must be I would be like squeeing, but I also understand like squeeing on the inside. <laughs> like, yeah, I always say like I'll squee like for real when you know I'm at the premiere. <laughs> it's like <laughs> okay, it's real. It's actually happening. They can't cancel it now. It's here. That's so so fun. Okay, <laughs> so this is so the next question is how did you go from like hey I'm a folk to <laughs> <laughs> like, what's your writer's story? What's your author journey story? Well, yeah, I used to, um, I used to be a financial analyst for MGM Studios in Los Angeles, and so I was definitely, you know, super analytical and working in spreadsheets all day, and and kind of using that part of my brain. And um, but secretly on the side, I was writing a novel, and um, that was kind of where my passion was. And then in 2005, MGM got bought out by Sony and everyone got laid off. And, you know, I was kind of devastated because I really did like my job, but I knew this was my chance to take my writing seriously. They gave, they gave us a six month severance package. And I was like, okay, it was basically the universe saying, are you for real? Are you serious about this? Here's like, you know, here's your chance. So I took the six month severance and kind of stretched it out for a, a long time. And I took on some kind of odd jobs that just to keep some cash flowing, you know, in. And about a year and a half after I quit or after I, I got laid off, I sold my first novel. So I think it was just like the pressure of like, now I've got to prove that I'm really serious about this. And uh, yeah, and I've been selling, writing and selling novels ever since. So, oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. So a year and a half, was that a year and a half to write your first book? Well, so the year and a half is sort of a, a false timeline because I <laughs> was writing before that. So it wasn't like, I was like, I'm going to be a novelist. And then a year and a half later, poof, it comes true. Um, I was, I had been writing for several years before that and, and never really kind of took it seriously or, or found the right story. But I will say that, and this probably segues into what you'd like to talk about, but I will say that I was kind of saved by a book called Save the Cat. And I was struggling to sell my first novel and I kept getting the same rejection letter from agents. And it said, this is great writing, but there's no story here. And I was really confused by that because I was like, what do you mean there's no story? There's like 400 pages of story. I can print it out, put it on my desk. But apparently I didn't know what story was. So um, some a screenwriter friend of mine actually recommended I read Save the Cat because it's all about structure. And I, as a novelist, I had no idea what structure was. <laughs> and so I read the book and it just changed everything. And I suddenly understood exactly what I was doing wrong. And I understood how to make my novel work. And I rewrote it. And after I rewrote it, I got an agent and we sold the book in 10 days. So I always say my, you know, my overnight success story took like several years, but it, <laughs> but it, it really does. I really kind of owe it back to save the cat, which is why I later, you know, just recently published a book called save the cat writes a novel, because I really thought, the, the sc Save the Cat is originally a screenwriting guide, um, and I adapted it to novels for novels um, for myself, and I wanted to show other authors how you could do it as well and how it could potentially change your life the way it did for me. Yeah, I think that's really powerful. I think Richard Fox, I interviewed him, and he was. I think he also like went used screenplays to to like you know read books about screenplays to write better because there's a different kind of and i guess i think also inez johnson because she's ns johnson because she's like you have to like she was a writer for tv and she's like you have to have this certain kind of <laughs> like movement i don't know if you can hear me snapping or not i'm snapping you yeah. guys <laughs> yeah yeah it, it's screenwriting it's all in the pacing and you know uh, the joke i make in the book is that Jane Austen and the Bronte sisters didn't have to compete with movies. <laughs> and so they had, um, they were able to take like a little bit more of a leisurely pace with the writing. But today, in today's day and age, we novelists not only have to compete with movies, but we have to compete with TV. We have to compete with three minute YouTube videos that capture people's attention really fast. And, you know, the sad truth is that our attention spans are getting shorter as a society. So as um, entertainers, and that's what a novelist is, we are are seeking to entertain people. We have to compete with that short attention span. So we have to learn how to write stories that captivate people quickly and that keep their engaged, keep them engaged. And that is all about 
pacing. And so what Save the Cat does is it it basically breaks down every story ever told into the same 15 beat template, or um, I call it a blueprint, like a story blueprint. And it shows how you can put pretty much any story into it and it works. Um, so if you are writing a story and you're struggling to make it work, naturally, if you took this 15, blu- 15 beat blueprint and you put, you know, you made your story, you, you wrote your story based on this blueprint, it's going to work just like every other story that fits in this blueprint, which is what I found pretty much all successful novels. Yeah. <laughs> uh, every movie, every novel. It's just, it's sort of like, I call it the secret storytelling code. It's this kind of code that's in, that's buried deep within stories that makes them resonate with us, that makes them work. And so if you can figure out what that code is, which is what Save the Cat is, um, you can make any story work. And so, and, and, and keep people engaged because it is kind of speaking to this storytelling code that that we all respond to. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Because I'll tell you something, and this was just before I reached out to you. And this is why I'm like, I'm reading this book. I need it. Because <laughs> I had written my first, like, f- I've, listen, I've read probably tens of thousands of books. Like, I'm a huge reader. Um, but I've just barely recently gotten into fiction writing. And mm-hmm. I wrote a short story for an anthology. And the first draft... I sent to to a friend and I was like, my main question was, is this a story? <laughs> Cause like in my head, a collection of scenes, you know, it was like this collection of scenes, scene after scene, after scene, you know, five little scenes. And I'm like, but I don't have, like, I could tell. I'm like, I just don't think it's a story though. I think it's just five scenes in a row. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's like, it's not a story. And then I, and then I was on a timeline and I hadn't read your book yet. So it's going to go out. Hopefully it's a story now, but the next one will definitely be a story. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I can well, and, read your book and follow those beats. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's great. And I wrote it, you know, to be not only a blueprint, but also a test, run, like a, I call it a test drive. So if you have a new idea and you don't know if it's a full story or you don't know if it has legs, as we say, um, like, can it carry, can it go the distance? Can it fill up a 300 page novel or even, you know, a 30 page short story? Cause the, the beats actually fit into short stories as well. And, it, and what you can do is if you have this new idea, you can go back to the beats and go, okay, well, can I figure out at least the majority of these beats? And if you can, then you have a story. And if you can't, then you either have to keep thinking about it or maybe, you know, change up the idea a little bit. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. So now that we're talking about these beats, mm-hmm. can you give us a general idea? I don't know if we have to go beat by beat. Yeah, well, I... Or I, bird by bird. Oh, 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 different book. Reference. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, it's funny. I have not read Bird by Bird. I need to read it. Um, it's Well, when I was writing Save the Cat, I've been writing... I've been working on Save the Cat for two plus years. It was a, it was a huge undertaking because I not only, you know, break down this story blueprint, but I also take 10 successful novels from our time and I and I beat them out using the beat sheet to kind of show you how novels you've probably read and loved um, fit into these 15 beats. And in order to get those 10, I read about 50 different books and wrote beat sheets for 50 different books to try to get you the, the most, um, the best examples. So I've just been all consumed with this book, but at the same time, I was like, I don't want to read any other craft books because I don't want, you know, any of those voices to kind of, affect me or influence yeah Mm -hmm. or seep in so i it's definitely on my list of um things to read now that save the cat is done (laughs) Uh, i'm not trying to make you feel guilty no it's (laughs) fine i'm like gasp (gasps) plenty of people have made me feel guilty um so you wouldn't be the first um but the beats yeah so so i well what i do is i i i kind of like to talk about the the beats that are most recognizable and they're sort of the easiest to explain and and as i I call them the the turning point beats. These are the beats that you're going to recognize the most in movies and books. And they kind of help you get a picture of what the beat sheet looks like. So the first beat that you're probably going to recognize is called the catalyst. And it comes about 10% of the way through the story. And this is the beat that is sort of an inciting incident. It is something that happens to the main character that pushes them into a new 
eventually will push them into a new direction. So it's sort of a break of the status quo, a life changing event of some sort. So for example, I'll just use Harry Potter because he, it's one of the best examples. Mm -hmm. Um, So for Harry Potter, this is the moment when he finds out he's a wizard. So the most famous catalyst of our time is you're a wizard, Harry, because you can't really go back from that. Like once you, once you, get that kind of news. So that's that's a common beat that you'll that you'll probably be able to recognize pretty quickly. Um, the next beat along the beat sheet is called the break into two. So if you're familiar with a three act structure, mm-hmm. Save the Cat follows a similar structure. It has three acts or we in in Save the Cat terms we call them worlds. So um, act one is the stasis world or the status quo world. Act two is the upside down world or the antithesis world. Um, And that is the break into two is when the hero or the character steps away from act one and into act two. So make some sort of proactive decision to leave an old world behind and enter a new one. And that can also be just a a decision to try something new. It doesn't actually have to be a physical leaving of a world. Um, so infamously in Harry Potter, it's when he boards the train for Hogwarts because mm-hmm. he is literally leaving the muggle world behind and entering the magic world. And then the next beat you probably recognize is called the midpoint, which um, obviously comes in the middle. It's about fifty percent of the way through. That's so clever. <laughs> I know, right? Some of the beats have clever names. Some of them just have obvious names. Um, the midpoint is also a turning point in that something major happens to turn the story on its head and to kind of shift the the direction and the physical direction, but also the emotional direction of the character. So this is the moment in Harry Potter where he wins the Quidditch match and he thinks everything's going great in this world, in this new world he's entered. But at that very, like the very next scene is when Hermione tells him that she thinks Snape was bewitching his broom and is trying to kill him. So it's like a raising of the stakes moment where suddenly nothing is what it seemed and everything takes on a new meaning. So this is the moment where Harry goes, okay, Hogwarts isn't this, you know, nice, cushy place I always thought it would be. Now my life is seemingly in danger. Um, So there's usually like a twist that turns the story again. And then there's a beat called The All is Lost, which happens about 85% of the way through. And it is exactly what it sounds like. It is when all is lost for the main character and um, they seemingly lose. So there's a sense of defeat in this beat. There's a sense of the rock bottom. Um, there's usually what we call in Save the Cat terms, a whiff of death, which basically means that something dies here. It doesn't even need to be physical, like a, a person or a animal, but something like a, a way of thinking or a hope or a, um, a plan dies. Um, so this is the moment when they realize, the kids in Harry Potter realize that um, Voldemort knows how to get to the Sorcerer's Stone. He has all the information he needs. So there is a sort of, I call it a reverse whiff of death, because if Voldemort gets the stone, he will be immortal, mm-hmm. um, which is obviously horrible for everybody else. Death for everybody else. Yeah, death for everyone else, <laughs> non-death for him. Um, and then there's the break into Act 3, which we call the break into 3, which is some sort of a resolution is created and acted upon in order to fix everything that's gone wrong throughout the entire story. So those are kind of the this is the moment when the when the kids in Harry Potter decide to go after Voldemort and the Sor- and the sorcerer stone themselves. So um, those are kind of the the I call them the foundational beats or the turning point beats. Those are make up the whole beat sheet. And then there's you know there's 15 beats. So there's plenty of beats that come in between those, <laughs> which helps people avoid like the saggy middle. You're like, what do I do in the middle? These oh, the middle. <laughs> yeah, I call it the muddle. <laughs> Um, cause it's, uh, it's, it can get very sticky, but one of the things that the midpoint really does is help you avoid the middle. And, you know, if you read the book, you'll, you'll learn all the magic of the midpoint, but, um, it gives you all of these tips of how to drive your story toward the midpoint and out of the midpoint so that there's always momentum in the middle, which is where many books will fall apart is because it loses momentum. Yeah. Um, questions. Yeah. A couple of questions. So, how so a lot of people a lot of authors they focus on like they build their story around their characters Mm. okay so how do you work that in how does that work with this 15 beat kind of structure well the save the cat beat sheet is 
it's a blueprint, but the other the other term we have for it is called a transformation machine. And basically what that means is you put a flawed character in one end of the machine, which is the first beat, and out of the other side, the 15th beat, comes a character who is a little less flawed. So it has been a little bit perfected, not perfected, but more perfected than they were. So you start with a character, and this is actually how I've laid out the book, is to start with your character. You find a main character or multiple main characters who have a very specific flaw. There is something wrong with them. There is something that needs to be fixed in their life. And that probably goes a little bit deeper than just, oh, I can't get a date or I I can't afford the house I want. You know, it's usually like the flaw goes much deeper than that. And you figure out who that character is and what their flaw is, and then you put them into this transformation machine, which are the 15 beats, and out the other side, they they come out a little bit better, and they have fixed some problem in their life. And I tell people to start with character and just to figure out who this flawed person is, because what is the point of the book if you're not going to take someone through some sort of transformation, right? You can write like the most epic space battles and the most, you know, engaging, thrilling murder plot. But if you don't change somebody throughout the journey, throughout the process, then you're going to leave readers going, yeah, so. And that's really what the beat sheet is about. It's about, and, and that's how you engage readers and make stories resonate is by is by changing people and transforming your character. Because I think deep down, we all have flaws that we're battling with and we all are on a journey of transformation. And so when you write about a character whose transformative arc feels organic and real and earned by the end, it resonates with us because that's what we're all trying to do. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I I could probably go through my life and think <laughs> of like different books. And I read a lot of self-help books too, but I could probably like match like in between self-help books, different fiction books that I'm like, that character and series got me through that because I needed to resonate with the badassness of the women. Right. <laughs> right? In order to get, I'm like, she's badass. I can be <laughs> badass. Like unconsciously, like at the time I wasn't like, oh, yep, looking for badass women books so that I can <laughs> identify that's probably, with them. Yeah, and that's why they them. resonated with you. <laughs> yeah. And you may not you may not even know it at the time that no, it's like no. something is speaking to you. And that's because you know, the author did their job and they, mm -hmm. they wrote a book that was about something or about, you know, that had substance. Yeah. And I happen to relate to the, I and many other readers. Oh, that's so curious. Okay. I'm going off on a tangent, like, <laughs> oh, the meta of this, because I'm totally woo woo. <laughs> so I'm like, I, so I love it. I'm woo woo as well. So <laughs> we can just rename the podcast, the woo woo Academy. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that is like my next thing. That and the naked podcast. Oh, don't, I love stay, it. don't take that idea, you guys. I've already like the naked podcast just because who doesn't want to? Okay. Why not combine it? The woo woo naked podcast. Oh, yes. Or the naked woo woo. Naked I don't know. woo woo. Now we, we just digress. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. This is like the best thing ever. <laughs> okay. I want to ask you. So, and I'm asking for people, a lot of people, uh, I want to ask you, it's like a combo kind of question. So I'm, okay. I've, you'll get the gist, I think. So it's a combination of, how do people keep their creativity? And part of me wants to, you know, keep their creativity when you have this formula. And part of me is hoping that you will touch on like the results, like that people will give to their readers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, okay. so the formula is the word we call the F word, um, or I call it the F word. Sorry. Um, Sorry. And yeah, it's a, you know, it's a common critique of the method. It's like, oh, I don't want my book to be formulaic. But here's the thing is that I've found the 15 beats in classics as old as, you know, the 1600s and as new as like, you know, Stephen King and the girl on the train. These beats are not necessarily a formula. They are a template for making a story work and a character and building a character who resonates. So you can have books as different as Pride and Prejudice and Misery, and you can find the same 15 beats. So I hesitate to call it a formula because it's really just this underlying story telling code that makes all stories work. So, you know, I mean, you can call it a formula, but it's sort of like, but it still works and it's worked for 
you know, thousands and thousands of authors throughout time. But at the same time, you know, I know that there's a concern about, oh, I have to like do this step by step thing. Well, here's the thing. So Save the Cat, and this is something I always like to make clear, Save the Cat is not necessarily just for plotters, you know, the whole plotter pantser. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've covered this before. Um, You know, there's a lot of pantsers who are like the people who write by the seat of their pants who don't plot in advance. who are like, I can't do it. I can't do a plotting method. I'm like, yes, you can. You just do it after the fact. So when you when you're a pantser, you usually just write and let the story tell itself. And you, you know, you go through that process all on your own. But then eventually you have to revise that book and you have to make it work. And it, it doesn't necessarily come out fully formed and working, as all pantsers know. It, you know, the structure has to get added in. And that's when you bring you break out the Save the Cat book and you go to your manuscript and you say, oh, OK, the midpoint. Well, I have a midpoint, but it's coming 70 percent of the way through. So I've got to fix that. And I don't really have a clear break into two. So I definitely need to strengthen that. And, you know, and there's a beat called the B story where you introduce a helper character like, oh, well, I don't have a B story, so I better put that in or my B story comes in too late. Things like that. So it's really on the other hand, if you are a plotter, then you would use the beat sheet up front to create your outline. Mm -hmm. And then you would write from that. So what I would say is like the structure gets added in somewhere. I'm not trying to change your writing process. I'm just trying to help you understand how story works so that you can in the end have a book that's going to sell to a publisher or or if you're a self-published author, that's going to sell to readers and that people are going to talk about. That's that's sort of the end uh, result here is that you can write any book you want. I mean, you could put it on Amazon tomorrow. We know that. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to resonate with people. And the key to writing a story that resonates is to understand how stories work and how characters transform. And so that's sort of the the help, the, like the cheat sheet I'm trying to give you mm-hmm. is to help you do that so that people are going to talk about your story and tell their friends and pass it around and go, you have to read this book. Yeah. It's, it's making me think of like, so I use this analogy like fairly frequently, <laughs> but I've done some quilting. And so I feel like, like I've used the analogy of quilting because you can make whatever kind of quilt, like you could pick whatever kind of fabrics that you want for your quilt. You could do like right. all pastels and have like a baby quilt. You could have like all Star Wars themed fabrics and have like a black Darth Vader quilt. Like you could do whatever. You- <laughs> sure. And yeah. you're going to have an entirely different story um, or quilt. Yeah. Based on the fabrics, but ultimately you have to have like the we have to have the backing, the <laughs> like like the basics of the quilt is like the t- the top, the back, <laughs> you know, the binding. Like you have to right. have all the pieces. Otherwise, you just have fabrics that are sewn together, but they don't actually make a quilt. They don't serve the function. Yeah. Yes. And I use a very similar analogy with baking. And I say, you know, when you set out to bake a cake, you have to have certain ingredients. Mm -hmm. You can like add all sorts of flavors and, you know, liqueurs and chocolate chips and whatever you want. But if you don't have the ingredients, you're not going to end up with a cake. You're going to end up with a cracker or, uh, you know, a loaf of bread Mm -hmm. or whatever. So when you set out to sell a story, you kind of have to know, tell a story. You have to know what the ingredients are. And then you add all of your own flair so that you end up with a story and not, you know, what you had five scenes or whatever it was. <laughs> I, know, um, I know it was like five scenes. <laughs> and now that, and, and since you listen, since you like listed those, I'm like, okay, phew, I got at least you got some, some of those, them, which Yay. is one of my, <laughs> which was one of my other questions. So there's these 15 beats. What happens if you have like 12 of the beats? So that question gets asked to me a lot. And it's, it's, it's a funny question to me yes. just because it's not really like a like a checklist of like oh if you don't have all 15 it's not a story you know it's it's i would think of it less as a checklist and more as a roadmap so let's say you have to get from like i call it the novel roadmap is another way i like to say it i have lots of words for it the transformation machine the novel roadmap the blueprint <laughs> lots of different whatever analogy is going to you know help it stick in your mind but if you think of like okay i've got to get from like san francisco to new york i'm going to drive on this road right Like, you're going to pass through a certain amount of states to get there. Otherwise, you're just, you know, if you want to drive in circles, it's one thing. But if you want to actually get to the finish line, you're going to have to pass through those, that that land, Mm -hmm. right? And so the beat sheet's sort of similar. It's like, I don't think you can write a story with the 12 beat with that like three beats missing, because it's like you wouldn't actually get to the end. So the, the beat sheet is really designed 
to kind of guide you to that end point. Um, you know, like the beats that I could maybe potentially see, like, oh, this book doesn't have a a B story, like that helper character. Like, you know, some people would argue um, the movie uh, Castaway with Tom Hanks doesn't have a B story because, which is the helper character who gets introduced uh, right after Wilson. they break into two. But then I would argue it's Wilson. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah so there's I mean. just, you know, you're, you're like, you're always going to have those beats and, and yes, there may be a, like the only one I can think of, it would be potentially the B story you would be able to potentially leave out, but I don't recommend it. Okay. Um, so, so if yeah. you do 12 beats, and not 15 beats. You have something, but it's not necessarily a story. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of like leaving the sugar out of the cake. You know, if you continue the analogy, it's like, oh, well, I have a really, I have something that looks like a cake, but it doesn't taste like a cake. Um, okay. And the, okay. the beats are really designed like they connect, right? So it's not like, oh, I'm just going to pick and choose which ones. It's, you know, there's always a cause and effect to the beat. So when you have the catalyst beat is always followed by what's called the debate beat, which is where the hero has to consider and debate and reflect on what just happened before he or she can make a decision. And that's just natural human behavior that when, you know, Harry doesn't go, Oh, I'm a wizard. Great. I'm boarding the train for Hogwarts tomorrow. He has to prepare for it. He has to go to Diagon Alley. He has to consider everything that's, that's happened. He has to get all of his supplies. So there's always that beat is always the, the, the effect of the, of the previous beat. So in that way, it is sort of sequential. Mm -hmm. What, um, what have you found? Hmm, what have you found is different between save the cat for screenplays and mm -hmm. save the cat for novelists? Well, the kind of obvious, most, most obvious answer is the page counts. <laughs> so <laughs> with a screenplay, it's 110 pages. You know, that's like mm -hmm. the guide they give you. And so even the screenplay book is written in a way where it says the catalyst has to come on page 12. Oh, wow. um, yeah. And the wow. break into two has to come on page 25. And they're very, they're very strict about that. But that's screenplays. Like in the screenplay world, there, there is a much more strict structure. Novels can be, as we know, anywhere between 200 pages and a thousand pages. You know, you know mm -hmm. like you could just, if you're Victor Harry Hugo, Potter. 1300 just pages. Look at the beginning of Harry Potter versus the last of Harry exactly. Potter. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and the beats sheet exists in both of those books. So, you know, the 15 beats mm -hmm. you can be found in both of those books. So for one, you know, I, I use percentages for the beat sheet instead of page numbers. So I say, oh, it, your catalyst should come around page. 10% mark. So whatever that ends up being in your, you know, page count. Um, so that's sort of the obvious one. Beyond that, there's really not that much difference in terms of the structure. But I do, the thing that, that Save the Cat writes a novel that has really, I think, helped people um, grasp the concept is that every example given throughout the book, and there's hundreds and hundreds of examples of the beats, and then there's the full beat sheet analysis for the 10 different books. They're all novel examples. So for me to be able to say, oh, you remember the moment when Mr. Darcy like surprises Elizabeth and says, by the way, I'm in love with you. That's the midpoint. That's the turning point. That's the twist that changes everything and makes her second guess everything she's ever thought of. Like for, for me to say that versus to use, you know, like Frozen or some mm -hmm. really popular movie, I think really helps people grasp onto the structure because essentially Save the Cat is not a screenplay method and it's not a novel method. It's a storytelling method. So I think whatever whatever world you're in, you want to see how other authors have, have done it. And that's what I think the novel version of the book really um, helps people with is just by giving you novel examples. Oh my gosh. <laughs> novel and novel. Clever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I wrote something down like way at the beginning of our interview that I wanted to ask you about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so like kind of offhand, you were like, Oh, I was writing for years and da, da 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 and then you're like, plus I was waiting for the right story. Yeah. So that is something like I'm really curious about because I've watched I think I watched the JK Rowling. Like there was some like T V movie done of her story. I watched it with some Yes. Who, who played her? She was really good. I know. I know. Uh, but I, I watched it and I was it like, was like oh a lifetime gosh. movie. It was great. Yes, it was great. Yeah. I loved it. But she had like, a, it was this, like this similar idea of, because she'd been writing for years and then finally like came up with the right story, at least mm -hmm. according to that TV movie. So yeah. <laughs> who 
knows if that's actually what happened, but I have this question about the right story and what does that mean for you? Well, you know, it's a different answer for me now than it was then, I think. Um, now, I, I'm convinced I can make any story work. Like, if you give me a, a logline, I could probably make the beat sheet work, um, you know, with enough ingenuity. But back then, when you're when you're still kind of floundering and trying to find your footing as an author, and you're not quite sure what the right story is or what story is going to sell or if that's your goal or what story is going to be you know, showcase your writing the best. It's not an easy answer. And um, I wrote a full-length novel that never saw the light of day, um, never sold, never did anything with. If I were to go back now, I could rewrite it and I could make it work. I know exactly what I would do. I'm not going to do it because it's just an old idea and I'm not excited by it anymore. Mm -hmm. I think the right idea is the one that you're excited about. It's the one that like makes you want to get up in the morning every day. Now, that is a dangerous thing to pin all your hopes on because the right idea is not going to be exciting for the entire process of writing. And I think that ends up being um, a downfall of a lot of uh, new authors is that they think that writing a novel means being inspired every single day. And it's not like that. Writing a novel is about motivation and determination and discipline. So I always say inspiration gets you started and discipline gets you finished. So you know, whatever that idea is that is really, really exciting you, whatever you can do to see it all the way through, even if you write like the crappiest first draft ever, I really, really urge writers to finish their projects. And it is it is far too easy to get lured away by the shiny new idea. And that shiny new idea will eventually become problematic too. <laughs> um, so it's, you know, there's sort of a I'm not really answering your question that well, but there is sort of a double-edged sword of like, write the idea that really inspires you, but don't quit when it stops inspiring you. That's actually, it's, it's, it's a good, that's a good, it's actually a good answer. It's okay. a very good answer. <laughs> like, I really like that because, because I think you're, because I think you're right. I think oh, you're right about the right idea. Oh my gosh. It's <laughs> so punny today. <laughs> like terrible pun. Um, but I think you're exactly right because I, I've seen a lot of authors who really want to be, who get really excited about the idea and then they get like maybe 60% mm -hmm. or something. And then they just kind of peter out and they're like, I got to start a new one. And I'm like, finish the book. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, like, like not just for you. I mean, although it will be transformational to actually finish your story, there's something really, really powerful about it. There is, there is. And until you've done it, you don't really know what it's like. Yeah. And, and, and once you do it, it is very empowering for everything else you do. Cause you always know that you're capable of it. Yeah. And it's kind of, and it becomes addictive too. You're like, yeah, oh, this feels good. Yes. Like, I don't it's know why it's like a so completion long. obsession. Like yes. that's, Me too. that's what I have anyway. <laughs> I do too. Like, and I used to, I was terrible. I'm a terrible, if anybody's listening, I was terrible at like wanting to research things until I wasn't excited about them anymore. I'd be like, okay, I can't do that idea because I have to do all this research. And then I wasn't excited. Mm -hmm. And then these last few years, I'm like, oh my gosh, completing things is so fun. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't care how bad it is. <laughs> yeah. And that's the right, I think that's the right attitude is you can't care how bad it is. Like, and then that's really, really hard for authors to accept. But, you know, one of my my most circulated piece of writing advice I will say on the internet is um, don't be afraid to write crap because crap makes great fertilizer. And I really honestly think that writing badly is the only way to finish. You have to allow yourself to be bad. You have to, you know, allow yourself to follow a train of, of thought or a, a train of ideas that's not working. You have to basically allow yourself to just get to the end no matter what. And then you can go back and finish it or uh, you can go back and revise it. Um, so, you know, one of the things I tell, especially um, young writers, I do a lot of um, workshops for teens and tweens and one of the things I tell, I try to instill in them is you cannot compare your first draft to a finished book on your shelf because that book has gone through a crappy first draft, a crappy second draft, a slightly better third draft, and like all of the revisions that follow. But you, you just have to, it's kind of a rite of passage. You have to get through that really bad first draft so that you know what you need to fix. Otherwise, you have no idea. You, you're you so removed from the story, you wouldn't know even know how to begin to revise it until it's finished. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So, uh, so how can you walk us through maybe one of your own books that you, I don't know, that you either wrote before you did the method and then transformed it to, or? Well, I didn't actually <laughs> sell a book until I started doing the method. Oh, good. So okay, I so... don't really have a book that, you know, I have books that did not I didn't use the method for and they like, you know, are not method for really books. books. Yeah, I've been using it for um, 17 books now. So I, yeah. And I have some two in development from Asian Motion Pictures. So it works, you guys. <laughs> boop, boop. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm finger gunning right now. It works. <laughs> pew, pew. <laughs> well, more more so than the, I think the, the, the film stuff, you know, it can be a lot of luck when it comes to getting films made. Um, but I think the, the biggest kind of confirmation that I'm on the right track is two things really is the, is the foreign editions, you know, like when you have a solid story, there's going to be foreign publishers who want to publish it as well. And so I think, you know, I've, I've sold, I don't know how many different, uh, foreign deals, but in over 23 countries. And, and then also on top of that is the work for hire that I get, I get hired to write books for Disney. So Disney basically will give me a, a one sentence, sometimes longer idea. And they're like, here's the world. Here's the idea. Now go and write it. And I will turn in a draft. Um, but really that's just me saying, okay, here's the idea. Now I'm going to put it through the, the 15B template and I'm going to give you a book. And that works for, you know, I've done middle grade books for them. I've done early chapter books for them that are um, 3000 words and they have all the beats in them. Wow. Um, so it's just, it's just what story is. And, um, and then on top of that, I think the other, the other kind of confirmation for me is that I've never been asked by an editor to write a page one rewrite. So I've never been asked, I've, I've had edits obviously, but I've never had an editor go, this isn't working, you need to start over. And I think that's just because I have the beat sheet to use as my own personal workshopping guide. And I, and I know when something's not working. And that's, that's something I like, I really feel for, for young authors um, and new authors is that as you get more experience and as you write more books and as you finish more books, your um, sense of what's working and what's not working will get honed and become stronger. It's like a muscle. Um, but at the beginning, it's really hard to know if you're on the right track, if you're writing towards something, if what you're writing is any good or if it's going to work. Um, that's something that I can tell about my own writing really quickly. Like I don't go down wrong tracks for long because I know very quickly. But the other thing that the Save the Cat beat sheet does is it kind of helps you know that. So if you if you have the beat sheet in front of you and you have you've just written 50 pages that don't really you know aren't really moving in the right direction towards that next beat, you know and you can rein yourself back in. So it's also sort of a workshopping, a self workshopping tool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can. I love imagining people like who who are writing these. Who, because here's the thing: this this podcast is for people who want to do this, like write for their living. Like, if you want to write yeah. for your living, because you can always just write. Oh, sure. Super duper abstract. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, you know, you can always write that, but if you're wanting to make it for your living, then then following the beats, whether you do it beforehand or afterwards, you know, if you, whether you pants it, like you say, this is what you got to do to get the people wanting to read your book because it's, it's calling forth to some kind of storytelling. You said earlier something about like, it's not, it's not a novel writing. It's not screenwriting. It's storytelling. And yeah, I, was like, oh. right. like, <laughs> I was like, Oh, drop mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Well, and it's funny because people will ask me like, well, you know, I love this one book and they'll name a book and they're like, I don't think the author knew, knows about Save the Cat. I'm like, yes, exactly. Because <laughs> it's not really inventing anything. It's not like saying, here's a brand new method that, that if you, if you use, it's like this magic pill that's going to, you know, nobody else knows about it. It's a secret. It's not that at all. It's actually just studying what already exists and what already works and then finding the pattern in it. So 
I, I know tons of authors who have written fabulous books and have never heard of Save the Cat. Um, but that doesn't really matter because they've just been doing it inherently. And, and there's some authors who do do it inherently. They just know they have a feeling, a gut instinct of how the story needs to come together and how you need to you know put in those ups and downs. For the rest of us, <laughs> we need help. So, um, I, you know, we need I, to we need a guide. So I interviewed somebody who she's like, I'm a pantser. And I was like, you know what? She has. But she's written like, you know. 200 books or something. And I'm like, she's, she doesn't need to outline <laughs> because she doesn't need to do the beat sheet because she's written 200 books. <laughs> yeah. And I guarantee the beat sheets in all of them anyway. Yes. yes. Uh, like it's, I, and she doesn't even, she's, she's an expert on what she's doing. She's unconsciously knows exactly what she's doing. She doesn't need a beat sheet. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what is your best advice for people who like are, are jumping into this industry of authoring? Um, my best advice is to write first every day before you do anything else. Um, that excludes, you know, like uh, brushing your teeth and eating breakfast and things Using like that. But I mean, <laughs> yeah, like all the, you know, do the normal things you have to do to survive as a human. But um, I tell people, and I actually teach a, I have a online workshop called Productivity Hacks for Writers. And this is sort of the core of my um, of my class. And it's the core of how I, I write four books a year. Um, I wrote I write about three to 500,000 words a year. And the, the way I'm able to do that is by just prioritizing writing. And so, you know, if you have a day job already, set your alarm back two hours and get up. And before you open a single email, before you check a single social media site, before you turn on the news, before you even look at your phone, sit down for just an hour and write. And, um, you know, some people may already do this, but the majority of people do not. And the, the sad fact is that when most of the time when we're writing, we are so distracted, we don't even know it. Because um, I like to use the, the analogy that our brain is like a computer. And every time you, you know, you restart your computer, like you go to sleep and you wake up, your computer runs really well. You even told me to shut down all my other browsers before mm -hmm. we started this interview because of the bandwidth issue. Mm -hmm. The more programs you have running in your brain, the less your bandwidth for each program. So if you wake up every morning with this brand new, you know, fresh computer, and the only thing you open is that document for your book, um, you're going to get more output in that hour than you would get in four or five hours of distracted writing after you've done all these other things. So that has been my number one secret to success is to just prioritize writing every morning and don't do a single other thing digitally to open any sort of brain computer, brain programs on my um in my brain yeah, computer in your brain computer yeah so that's the one program <laughs> do, do i have using. any other tabs open just no no tabs <laughs> um so that the one program i am using and the one program i need to work really well is working the best it can be because essentially every time you wake up and the first thing you do is check email or social media is you're basically saying everybody else is what everybody else wants from me is more important than what I want from me. Because what is email? It's just people asking you for things. Um, and social media is just people talking about themselves. And so every time you prioritize that you are taking a little bit away from your own priorities. So if your priority is to make a living, then that's the first thing you should do every day is work on that. I just, I just was, Oh snap. <laughs> I was like, yes, I haven't had anybody say that that clearly because everybody's like so, so many new authors, their biggest challenge is finding time to write. Yeah. But if you do that, if you make it that priority, but I love the, the cost that you said, what you're doing is making everybody else's stuff more important than yours. And yeah. Tim Ferriss talks about that. You guys, if anybody likes entrepreneurial books, Tim Ferriss talks about that in his four hour work week. I'm a um, huge fan of Tim. Ferriss. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, me too. But I like the way you said it even better than the way he said it. <gasps> Snap, <gasps> Ferris. I know. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I want to know where can people find you, including the Save the Cat and including the pr Productivity Hacks for Writers? So my website has everything you need. Um, okay. If you go to my website and you click on um, jessicabrody.com and you click on, there's a little thing on the menu bar that says for writers, that's going to take you to my writing mastery portal. And so my, um, uh, my the writing mastery portal basically has um, all of my books about writing, which is one. 
<laughs> Save the Cat Rights novel. Um, but it's got uh, links to all of my online courses. So I have about, I think, five or six courses online now. Those are, these are on uh, a site called Udemy. They are completely on demand. Um, They're done. Take them whenever you want. Like you just enroll and you do it at your own pace. So no need to like fit it into your schedule when I'm going to be online. It's just if they're pre-done, they're pre-recorded. So there's a there's a few classes there, including a Save the Cat companion class um, that you can take along with the book, and um, that will help you kind of implement the beats. And it's you know sort of me in person kind of leading you through the the process. Um, and then I've got an, a class on idea generation. Speaking of the right idea, I've mm -hmm. got a class on that. Um, I've got the productivity hacks class for sort of more beginners. I've got a foundations of fiction writing class. Um, so that's all on the writing mastery portal along with, um, I blog regularly with writing tips. Um, you can also sign up for my writing mastery newsletter, which is a free monthly newsletter. They just, I just send you writing tips every month for free. Um, so you can sign up for that there too. Oh my gosh. Okay. Everybody's going to like go. Go do it. JessicaBrody.com <laughs> slash writing mastery or just go to JessicaBrody.com and click for writers. JessicaBrody.com. Click for writers. We'll also have this linked in the show notes, you guys. So if you're like later, if you're driving and you're like, shoot, just I can't write it down. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Awesome. This has been amazing. Like there's a huge amount of information there. I think was really, really useful for people. And I really appreciate you giving us your time like this. No problem. And thank you for having me on, on the podcast. It was fun. Thank you. And you know, everybody who's here giving us your time here listening, we really appreciate you too. Hugs and happy authoring here from Author Like a Boss. Hey boss, you made it to the end of the episode. You're the best. Because of that, I'm going to give you a special invitation to find out more about the Author Boss Academy, where I and a bunch of really awesome authors hang out, have fun, and get stuff done. If you end up joining, tell me the secret word and you'll get a special bonus. Find out more about the Academy at authorlikeaboss.com forward slash Academy. The secret word is nipples. <laughs> Hugs and happy authoring. I hope to see you soon. If you love the Author Like a Boss podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes. Until next time.